Rebecca Helms sent me a Parasaurolophus, which is sometimes called Parasaurolophus if you're in a godless commonwealth country. I can totally take this apart. It's, um, the first thing that strikes me, it, it's, it's structured and postured in the old fashioned, like what you'd see in like Disney's Fantasia with the semi-aquatic, hunchbacked, gangly looking thing. Which thing you need to know about hadrosaurs, which is late Cretaceous, rather large herbivores that walked on four legs and ran on two. Ornithopods is the group, because they had feet that looked like bird feet. Which isn't to say they're the only group that had feet that looked like bird feet, but paleontological names don't always make sense. The thing you need to know about them is they were land-based, they were reasonably heavy, and they were pretty well built. They were sturdy creatures. On the subject of paleontological names not making sense, it's called Parasaurolophus or Parasaurolophus. It means near Saurolophus. When they found it, they, they saw this crest on its head and they decided, oh, this must be closely related to Saurolophus, which is another hadrosaur. Turns out it's closer to like Lambiosaurus and them. So they didn't bother renaming it because it doesn't really matter what's it, what it's named as long as it's not the same name as something else. Science. So as far as changes go, for starters, it's tripodal again. And in this case, there's no excuse, toy maker. This could be postured as a quadruped and still be accurate. You didn't need to make it a scaly kangaroo. Kangaroo is an interesting comparison because that's probably the only... It's the only modern creature that browses on four legs and runs on two, in kangaroo's case, hops on two legs that I can think of. So that sort of makes sense. There was, um, I forget his name, but there was a museum curator that would posture iguanodon as if it was a wallaby, but he had to break the tail to do it. So tilt the whole animal forward, get the front legs on the ground. The front legs are pretty small, by the way. Both the legs, the, the haunches and the shoulders should be a little beefier. And when you have it standing in a tripodal pose, it winds up being this hunchback. But if you tilt it forward like it was in life, it, it's instead this sort of dramatic uh, uh, straight rectangle uh, for the back going down into the neck and then back up into the head. And that's pretty cool looking. There's no modern equivalent for that kind of thing. While we're talking about posture, the tail is really rat-like. Uh, it's, it's a little too bendy. Also, it's resting on the ground. It would have had its tail out, even when it was in quadrupedal stance. Its tail would have been straight out. I don't remember if it had the reinforcing bony rods that like a theropod would have. We have that in some Ornithischians. I don't know if we have it in Parasaurolophus specifically. Uh, but if it did, even if it didn't, um, it had really tall, uh, spinal processes on the spine, of course on the spine, on the vertebra uh, starting about halfway into the back and then over the hip they were really tall and then descending into the into the tail. So its tail was pretty rigidly straight out and, and uh, uh, thicker than this. Also as we tilt the animal forward, you're tilting the hip forward too. The, the hip stays at a right angle to the um, back but the, the femur should be a little bit projecting forward from it. Basic takeaway, the hip is parallel to the ground, uh, whether it's on four legs or two. The ischium, this is an ornithischian, so the pubis is forward but the ischium is backward, and, and you would see that reflected in the, the look of the tail underneath. It's splay-legged too. <laughs> The, the legs are really far apart. They should be under the creature. It's, it's weird that they... It, it makes for a very stable toy having them that far apart, but uh, on the subject of the legs, it's digitigrade at least. Uh, it's standing on its toes. That's cool. The feet are a little too flat-footed. Like, they should be a little more elephantine. It did have, you know clear toes and clear claws on those toes, but they, they, they were 
slightly hoof-like, and it, it definitely had pads under the, the hind feet and under the front feet. The front feet, incidentally, are lacking their fourth finger, which probably didn't contact the ground. It was, it was a little shorter and a little higher up than the other three, but it, it had pads. Uh, we found some trace fossil of soft tissue, and I always get really excited about trace fossil for some reason. Soft tissue from a, a hadrosaur. I don't know if it was, I don't think it was Parasaurolophus specifically, but for a, a time they thought it was, oh, that's webbing to go between the fingers because it's clearly living in swamps. No, it was, it was a deflated fleshy pad for walking on, and that's pretty cool. So it was, again, terrestrial creature. It almost looks like, the, the, the feet definitely look like they're supposed to have webbing between them on the toy at least. So that's, that's wrong. Shame. Speaking of soft tissue, the, the, the texture of the toy is this sort of wrinkly, leathery look. We know that Parasaurolophus specifically had um, little uniform round bumps for scales. Uh, because again, we have trace fossils. Of the, I don't know why I always get excited about trace fossils. Probably because we so rarely get a glimpse into you know, the non-bone part of dinosaurs. Slightly tantalizing. And just generally speaking, I mentioned that it's rectangular, but it should be, th this is a really emaciated creature. Like, it was lighter than you would think based on the size. It was 30 odd feet long, probably longer. We, we have partial skeletons of very large specimens of Parasaurolophus, but uh, weight-wise, it, it would have weighed as much as a small elephant. So this, it, it, give it a little more meat. <laughs> As far as the neck and head go, they at least have tried to give it an S-curve, but it, the, the neck is going into the bottom of the skull when it really should be going into the back of the skull. The head itself is probably pretty accurately sized, but the snout is a little too long. Um, in profile, uh, a hadrosaur skull, and particularly Parasaurolophus, would be Sort of a, a right triangle, uh, and then with the crest projecting backwards. Concerning the crest, maybe a little too straight, honestly. Uh, I, I think this is supposed to be Wakari. There's a few species that we know of for, for Parasaurolophus. Wakari had, had the big, fancy crest, but it should be a little more curved. This is a little too straight. Um, it doesn't look like they've given any appearance for it having a beak on the front of its mouth, and it's kind of important. It, it, it had the chewing batteries like, like any ornithodiron, but had the beak in the front for, for snipping. And they've given it eyebrow ridges. I don't know why they always do this. They, even in creatures that would not have had eyebrow ridges, they, they give them just these big, flat, looking expression, probably for that reason. It makes it look more fierce. It makes it look angry. But... Uh, the crest is really the most prominent structure on the top of the head, not the eyebrows. Uh, there's also a skin flap on the back of it. Sure. I don't think we have any evidence for attach points for soft tissues uh, on the bottom of the crest, but we don't have any evidence saying that there wasn't one. And Rebecca Helm specifically requested that I uh, uh, talk about what the crest's function was. Uh, she asked if it was used to make sounds, and that's a theory. There are air passages going through the, the crest of Parasaurolophus and several other hadrosaurs. Some had solid crests, but Parasaurolophus didn't. It had uh, clear passages coming up from the nasal uh, and through the crest. So one of the theories is that it was used for auditory signaling, which is to say it was used for honking. Uh, I don't remember where the source is for this, but I'd heard that uh, Sound-wise, it would sound pretty similar to a trombone, which is cool to me because I play trombone, so I'm making Parasaurolophus noises, except they could probably only make one note. Anyway, secondary, or, well, another idea is that it was for visual identification of, you know, this is a mature individual. There's, maybe not for Parasaurolophus specifically, but for other hadrosaurs, there was sexual... Um, Dimorphism, which is to say 
males look different from females. We saw this in Pteranodon also. Uh, I might not have mentioned this, but having a big crest on your head is a pretty common Archosaurian solution for, I am sexually mature, please mate with me. So it's not unreasonable to say that that's what its purpose was in Parasaurolophus. Another idea that might be equally valid is there were other hadrosaurs walking around at the time. Uh, North America, late Cretaceous, this would have been right around 75 million years ago. Maybe they couldn't immediately tell the difference between one another. We don't know what kind of colors they were and so forth. So we do know that they, they were visually oriented just based on the evidence around their orbit. Uh, Maybe they needed some kind of visual identifier for, hey, that's one of my species, that isn't, because the crest looks different. Which is a cool idea. I hope that covered everything you wanted to know about Parasaurolophus. Thank you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Even request dinosaurs for me to talk about. Or send me a toy dinosaur like Rebecca did. Our address is in the description. Uh, you could go to thegeekgroup.org to find out how to become a member and donate and we'll see you next time. This video was made possible by a grant from the Future Girl Foundation. This video was made possible by thousands of private donations from members and viewers like you. Please visit thegeekgroup.org for more information on how you can donate and become a part of our dreams of Avalon.